could the Rockies' path to contention be laid in what the Rangers have already done? And what do these two teams have in common most? Let's get into that in this crossover edition of Locked On Rangers and Locked On Rockies. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked on to the Texas Rangers and locked on to the Colorado Rockies. I am Bryce Patrick, cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan since 2010, the founder and host for all four seasons of the Locked On Rangers podcast. Joining me today is host of Locked On Rockies, Paul Holden, a longtime suffering Colorado Rockies <laughs> fan and a, what is this, two, three years as host of the Locked On Rockies show? Just finished up season number two, so we're we're heading into my first ever normal off-season since being a host of uh, of this show, like there's no lockout, there's no COVID. So, you know, we kind of, I actually get to experience usual Rockies disappointment and on a usual schedule now. Well, yeah, I mean, I've been hosting the show since 2019 and well, actually this is, this is my first regular (laughs) off season too. I mean, if I had started like a year earlier, there were there weren't a whole lot of locked on LA podcasts before them. But that that's neither here nor there. What is here is our two teams coming off of disappointing seasons after spending big on free agents that teams did not expect them to sign. And I, I listened to your show yesterday. You had an excellent rant about just what are the Rockies doing? The Rangers felt like they were in a similar position just a couple of years back of like this team feels kind of hopeless and what is the path forward i mean the rockies have at least developed a few stars out of their farm system the rangers have really really struggled to do that so the rangers you know they had a a weird plan to turn things around it it felt kind of you know halfway done They, they kind of decided in the middle of the 2020 season thankfully they were bad enough to pivot into a full rebuild only said the word rebuild in 2021 literally the one year they've actually said out loud with their mouths this is a rebuilding year was 2021 it was painful they lost 102 games for the first time since the 1970s and this year they were better they spent a whole lot of money the last couple of off seasons this year they got jacob de grom they also signed andrew heaney and i feel like the rangers have not done a good job of finding market inefficiencies but i i think they've found one in um I believe the word is trying. I believe that's how you pronounce it. And paying <laughs> players what they're worth, paying stars good money to sign a free agency. And I feel like, I don't know if you feel the same way, but I think that might be the most viable path forward for the Rockies to contend in a division that, like the AL West, the NL West is maybe even scarier. The Rockies have to be willing to do more in free agency. I think they they do they believe in a draft and develop team. They like you've mentioned they have developed players. But let's take a look at the, the, the and, and you you might have heard it on my show yesterday. But they developed three pretty darn good people. And tell me if you've heard about these people before: Nolan Arenado, Trevor Story, and DJ Lemayhew. Where are uh, all three of those players who's right that? now? I don't know any of those guys. <laughs> you know. <laughs> The, none of those players are on the team anymore. They have been able. There's a lot of players that the Rockies have had and and play, pitchers. I mean, for example, Tyler Anderson was a longtime Colorado Rocky, and he goes out to L.A. and has a very good year. Uh, you're going to probably see it, I think, next year in your division. I think Carlos Estevez is going to be a name you're going to learn really quickly that uh, as someone who's going to be a solid bullpen piece for the angels it's a nut and and that kind of ties into this too with the rangers the rockies develop and then they don't hang on so right now the rockies are banking on four big prospects maybe uh, that are going to be spending that are going to make the roster next year are going to play and they played a significant amount of time at the end of last season which was a great sign for rockies fans just because the rockies did finally throw in the towel and say we're going to play prospects. They never have used that rebuild word because they never will. They have, they've said when they have said the word rebuild, they have said, we are never going to do that. We believe that we have the talent, blah, blah, blah. blah. And so, yeah, it's, it's a matter of, yeah, you can develop these prospects, but then 
you're not hanging on to them. I mean, they they have spent money and extended contracts to a lot of people and extended Nolan Arenado. They got that deal done. But then why what what if you're so passionate about these players that you're developing, why are three all-stars, the ones that got you back to the playoffs in the for the first time in franchise history to back-to-back -back seasons? Why are the three people that were instrumental to that run not still on this team to go at these super teams that the Dodgers and the Padres? If the if the if the Rockies had that team with the and and like you said, Bryce, come in this if they took the Rangers approach in 2019 and said and said we're going to be like it will be like the Rangers. You know, kind of, I know it's they looked they looked into the multiverse. They saw what the Rangers did on in this timeline. And they said, all right, we're not going to just settle for Daniel Murphy or Ian Desmond. We're going to go out. I mean, I can't remember any of the free agents. Well, off the top well, of my head. I don't I, I don't want to have any, any right. Ian Desmond slander on this podcast. I love that man. And I, what's Ian happened Desmond to him is a phenomenal is a, human being. It's a darn shame. <laughs> but was statistically the worst player in baseball during his time for the Rockies and didn't even finish his contract with the Rockies. The pan he didn't play in the pandemic season and walked away from the game uh, before his contract was even up. And then the Rockies decided to go with Daniel Murphy when instead they should be looking for the CJ Crones. CJ Crone was just floating around out there and they could have gone after him. The Rockies, I don't think, have the ability to be like someone like the Rangers or I'm going to say like the Mariners because maybe even not having to make the big Chris Bryant moves, but go make the trade for a Colton Wong type player or go make some of these deals where you can kind of get these MLB ready players or actually fully commit to your prospects that turn out to be great because how am, what am I supposed to, how am I supposed to feel about this team being a draft and develop team when the best players that I've seen them draft and develop aren't there anymore. And I, they, but at least I can say they have backed it up the last couple of years and have uh, spent money extending contracts uh, for players like Kyle Freeland, Ryan McMahon, Herman Marquez, uh, their, uh, Antonio Senzatella, all these players that have been solid players for the Rockies. Uh, they have gone out and spent that money. But again, it circles back to why them, why the money there, why the focus there, and not when you had an infield of all-stars just three seasons ago. Yeah, that is definitely a frustrating place to be and something <clears throat> that I, I voiced my own frustrations with the Rangers being in a similar position. Coming up, we're going to look a little bit more specifically how these this team, at least the Rangers, are starting to fight that and how the Rockies could kind of look at a similar angle even more. And a former Rocky who they let go, who is now on the Rangers. But first, this episode is brought to you by the NHTSA. You're hanging out with some friends and putting back a few drinks, and a few becomes a few too many. As the evening comes to an end and people start to head out, you think of calling for a ride. But nah, you live nearby. You can make it home. It's no big deal. What are the odds you'll get pulled over anyway? Even so, what's the worst that could happen? Your insurance goes up? You lose your license? You lose your job? You total your car? You kill someone? Everyone knows about the risks of driving drunk. The results are tragic and often deadly. However, that still doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. Now, the Rangers, I did say they hadn't done a great job of drafting developing like the Rockies had done the last few years. One thing they did do well in their actual rebuilding seasons is sign old pitchers and fix them. That is something that the Rangers did well time and time again. They did it. They made three all-stars out of guys who were having middling careers for the most part, had some promise and just didn't quite pan out. They did it with Mike Miner. They did it with Lance Lynn, by the way, who are one and two in Rangers, Rangers single season baseball reference war season for pitching. They did. They both did it in 2019. Um, they also did it. It's kind of weird. Just, just really weird. The rest of the Rangers pitching staff that year was absolute dookie garbage. Um, and Joey Gallo and Hunter Pence were amazing for the first half and were hurt. Uh, really a missed, missed opportunity there to break that playoff drought before it got to the six seasons that it's been. Now, they also did it um, with Kyle Gibson, who was an all-star, and they traded to Philadelphia. But I don't think the Rockies have, have done that super well, but just being able and being willing to pay at the top of the free agency market is 
is how you have got to do that. I mean, look at the teams. I mean, Dick Montford said the Rockies are never going to rebuild. The Rangers never said never, but it kind of felt like it. They were waiting into that mediocrity, and they were honestly saved by sucking in the first half by those back-to-back-to-back-to-back grand slams that honestly saved the Rangers because it, it they went into an absolute crater after that, and it kind of gave them the excuse to be like, okay, well... We officially suck. We can't even trick ourselves into that anymore. Um, but we are going to, we're going to finally say rebuild. But if you look at the teams, I mean, who are the teams that haven't sucked for the last like ten years? Haven't sucked at all the last 10, 12, 15 years. I mean, there's really only three teams that come to mind. I mean, stop me if I'm wrong, but I think it's Yankees, Dodgers, and the Rays. Am I am I missing anyone? Well, you could start saying the Astros probably at this point. I mean, it's it's not ten years long worth of dominance. About but to say that, it, about to say it's, but they did have they did have those years where they sucked and very tremendously. People forget that. People forget that, how the bad Astros the Astros were. The were. worst team in the, the Astros to get to where they were went through a period of being the worst team in baseball for and it and it wasn't short and then. You know, we talk about rebuilding. It's, it was like it, three, it, four seasons. It was a long time. It was most of their existence up until now. If, it, if I mean, obviously there was the heydays in, in the middle, but there was a good chunk of, of time in the middle where the Astros were, well, were mostly fair, an afterthought. But there were a lot of times where they were where they weren't trying. They were just accidentally bad. Then they had three, four years where they were on purpose super bad, and they mm-hmm. they did actually go to a World Series and got swept in two thousand and five by the White Sox. But but yeah. Yeah, it, it's the the rebuild also doesn't always work. I mean, Baltimore, it's finally paying off. Pittsburgh, <clears throat> maybe some pieces and stuff. So, but that's why when you're the Rockies and you, you don't face the issues that these other teams face, you you're the Rockies can be such a unique team, but instead they just don't embrace being weird. The Rays, since embracing being weird, have been perennial playoff teams, have been thorns in the side, have changed the way we looked at baseball. When the A's are good, they're creative. They think. They do stuff outside of the box. Why is so the Rockies love to just have – they don't want to go out and bring someone in that's looking at the Rockies right now and saying, let me just build you a lineup of people that rip doubles and then put four people in there that hit home runs. That is what we'll do with the DH. Or, hey, I have pitched and been in altitude my whole life. I've worked with pitchers. I've studied pitching in altitude. And there's success stories of good pitchers. There are good Colorado Rockies pitchers. Bryce – Here's a random thing for you. How many offensive players are representing the Colorado Rockies in the World Baseball Classic this year? Well, I cheated or and listened to your podcast Across the country, yesterday. by it's, the way. It's zero. It is zero. On the flip side, there are five Rockies pitchers that are representing teams across the World Baseball Classic. Now, t- tell me if that's not an upside-down view of, of what people think the Rockies are. And this is another thing. Your offense is bad. Leaning on prospects to just come up and be great is not the ideal way to fix this offense. Chris Bryant coming back is not going to be the thing. So why were the Rocky? Why did the Rockies not offer Cody Bellinger two more million dollars? It's a one-year deal. Just say, hey, whatever the Cubs are going to offer, the Cubs might be a more exciting place for Bellinger to go. But you no, have I, to be- honestly. I don't. I don't know that it is because I mean you have. Coors, I mean, he's a great defensive outfielder. He's hit there a lot, probably hit pretty well. Um, and, well, uh, just personally, I, I don't know, just maybe an assumption. I think he might like the the Colorado lifestyle and be pretty good there. But you're exactly. But it's also and it's also it's a way less serious of a fan base. Guess what? Because here's the deal. If Cody Bellinger sucks for a year for the Rockies. No one cares. Because they'll They're just go forget. somewhere else. And then the Rockies, next, the best prospect coming up that isn't the big four, uh, in case Rangers fans are curious, Aileris Montero, Ezekiel Tovar, who everyone views as the big next shortstop of the future, Michael Tolia, and uh, this guy, Sean Bouchard. He was not one of those three that I named. Those first three were kind of the big buzzword ones. But Sean Bouchard got called up at the end of the last year and played a really good outfield, which the Rockies are looking for. So uh, this is, if you're willing to buy, go for Chris Bryant, why didn't you? Why wouldn't you be in on the Bellinger? Because then you can go out and say, "Oh, guess what, Rockies fans? Our starting outfield next year, a couple MVPs, 
Couple MVP. You love belly bombs. He did it enough against us. I mean, if Cody Bellinger was good against one team, is the freaking Rockies, you know, and and his success in Coors Field. So that's the thing. Pick something. Do something. If you're the Rockies, actually go with the identity or bring other people in. Stop only hiring from within your organization and start bringing people from the outside to embrace the weirdness that is Colorado baseball because this team's never going to compete in the NL West when they're 20 games out of the, the, the picture by August and they can't hit on the road. And uh, there's just so many holes, but then they go and they sign Chris Bryant and you're like, what? Why? What are we doing? But it's but at the same time, Chris Bryant is going to have an impact on this lineup next year. The Chris Bryant is going to help this team win games. Chris Bryant is the type of player the Rockies need in this lineup right now. But why stop there if you're going to make that move? And then why do the other moves that led to this other than the Rockies just had this fascination with Chris Bryant and they finally were able to get it done. I, that really might be why that deal got done was just that this team has had a history of loving Chris Bryant and they finally had the chance and they could go for it because they have, they, they haven't done nothing this off season. They have made moves. It's a series of small moves. They've replenished their bullpen with veteran pitchers, which honestly is great for, because the Rockies turned to their farm system last year and, and their young guys for bullpen. And it was not good. The Rockies bullpen was atrocious. So the Rockies have made some lower stakes moves that could be interesting. But when you're willing to dive in for that one player, why aren't you in there? And and, and you kind of tease this. If you want to bring elite pitching to Coors Field, you're going to have to back up the truck. If you want DeGrom, Verlander, these names, those, those caliber names to come to your team, you got to back up the truck because the, no one wants to pitch here, especially when you look at the fact that the Rockies right now, the way they're coaching their pitching is regressing. All Rocky starters last year regressed. Yeah, uh, Chad that, Gould was good for a little bit and then completely fell off. There's the, the that consistency. <laughs> like, there's a lack of consistency everywhere. Yeah, that's that is rough. And uh, coming up, there is a pitcher that I want to talk about who did want to pitch for the Rockies but was let to go to the Rangers. But first, this episode is brought to you by BetOnline.net. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. You can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro, pro football to college bowl season to basketball and the World Cup. We have got it all at BetOnline.net. If you are wanting to place some odds, I'm sure they will be coming up pretty soon, of these teams not finishing at, as the worst teams in their division? Well, I think it'll be a little bit better for the Rangers not finishing fifth. If you want to bet on the Rangers to finish third, if you're wanting to bet on the Rockies to improve with their confusing and small moves, if you're feeling good about that, head to the website today. It is the best place to get in your betting fix or use your mobile device to learn more because bet online, it's where the game starts. Now, there is a pitcher who did like pitching for the Rockies, who was not even given a qualifying offer, and that is John Gray. I'm sorry to ruin your mood, but uh, we had we had to we had to talk about the Gray Wolf, a guy who had a honestly very confusing first season in Texas. It had some it started with some real lows. He had two IL stints in his first two starts with the Rangers. Then come the months of June and July, he is absolutely phenomenal. Then he misses some more time, misses almost all of August, and a decent chunk of uh well, actually, I don't think he missed much time in September. He just wasn't very good. But you look at those months of June and July. He was the Rangers' best starter in those months, better than Martin Perez. Uh, in six starts in June, he had a 239 ERA, 37 and two-thirds innings, 44 strikeouts. He was a strikeout machine going deep into games. Um, then in July, he had five starts there, a sub-3 ERA, um, 30.1 innings and 37 strikeouts. The guy showed what he can do when he's healthy, um, but it's just a matter of of when he's healthy. I mean, this year he pitched the fourth most innings of any Rangers starter, only 24 starts, 127 innings, and did have 134 strikeouts, which per nine led the Rangers. So is, is this about what you expected from John Gray? I wasn't sure what to expect exactly. I think just a few more innings and a little bit better overall was what I was expecting. But still, I did like what I saw from him. John Gray is a great third arm. 
in your rotation. And I think when the, the the worry that I had when Gray signed with the Rangers and when we talked a little bit was like, here's our number one. And it's like, it, yeah, I mean, he's capable, but the health has always been a thing. And uh, one of the things I think he dealt with is blisters. He gets nasty yep. blisters that really impact his ability to pitch. But that was and, uh, the second actually, IL stint, I think. The first one, actually, maybe that was the first, I think that was the first one. And then the knee was the yeah. second one. And then there was an oblique later on. So he only had the blisters once this year. So yeah. He, he, he'll hit the IL. That's that's the issue. And I guess, actually, I missed out. I, I thought I must have missed out on Gray because I've been saying Gray was statistically better than all the Rockies rotation. But there's still some some truth there. If he was healthy, I think he that sub four ERA. And yeah, he has a better ERA. I think if he stays healthy, I think there might be an argument to be made uh, that uh, that he still was there. I mean, he, he was better than than three fifths of the rotation for sure. I here's the deal. I would take John Gray back right now. Easy. If the rock, especially with the Rocky, the Rockies dug themselves an unnecessary hole and it's gotten worse. Now, uh, last year going into the office, they could have, if they brought John Gray back, then you really wouldn't need to worry about starters. You, you, you had it all set. You had your starting core that you believed in that got you to the playoffs and was still fine. Yes. John Gray never truly reached his potential, but John Gray strikes people out. And when John Gray is striking people out, he's on, it's a great, great sign for him and for his team. That one being of the, said, one yeah. of the things that I, I did want to touch on, I think you talked about it either, either, either like five minutes ago or yesterday, all, all of time blends <laughs> together in my mind. Um, but you talked about the Rockies pitchers regressing. And I think that's one of the things that the Rangers were able to sell themselves to gray on. It's like, yeah, he's got that great slider. And it seems like Rockies coach was like, yeah, it, it's as good as it's going to get. And the Rangers are like, Nah, we can make it better. He added a, a sweeper, they call it, just a more le- horizontal uh, version of that slider that was very, very effective this year. And I also had the same concerns of like, all right, Gray was my top choice, but the Rangers needed more depth last year. That was very, very evident. This year, they have that depth. And John Gray, I think, is at this point the Rangers number three. You have DeGrom, I think Martin Perez should be the number two. I think that uh, there's a lot of people who are thinking he's going to regress a lot more than he do- than I think he will. Then you have Gray as your number three. And then four and five is one of Andrew Heaney or Jake Odorizzi. And like that's that's as deep a rotation as the Rangers have had since like 2011, maybe mm-hmm. even 2000, maybe 2016. But like... Man, it makes me feel a lot better. And him and, well, pretty much everyone on that starting staff has got some injury concerns. And they do have a few guys below that that could be serviceable number five rotation guys or at least fill-in guys in Dane Dunning and Glen Otto. And Gray's going to benefit from being the third guy, from seeing the lineup three. He's playing game three of the three-game set, of seeing he is – that's just a benefit for him because I just think – He's better in that middle thing because he's he slept on a little bit. He's got that ability to strike people out. And again, yeah, going from a place that 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 believes in pitching and contact and 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 you know doing something like that in Colorado. Now going and a little hesitant with with moving pitches because of altitude and things like that. Now he can go to somewhere like Texas and and really flourish with two guys ahead of him that are really really good. I mean, Degrom that. That's a such a great move for the Rangers, and it's so a, happy, again man. like the big difference there is how do you build up of the Rangers being one of the the biggest or one of the biggest spenders of last year's off season? Let's go get Jacob freaking Degrom, and, and I mean because everything after that signing is icing on the cake. That's at least still a sign of commitment to build. We just brought in these players, we're, and we're bringing in more, and I mean that's. To get Seeger into this, into that, I mean, that, that's just, that's the plan in place. Is it, is it enough to take down the Astros? We'll see in the Mariners. We'll see, but it's, it's oh. at least enough to tell your fan base, this is the plan. This is what we're doing. We're, and we're going to keep building up this pitching stuff. Whereas you can't say the same in Colorado because everyone is hitting the track races and everyone's willing to spend, spend money there. I mean, L.A. might not have spent money yet, but they will. The Padres have made the biggest moves at the trade deadline and followed that up with immediate major contracts when they make those deals. And the Giants just 
got the second biggest fish. They were willing to go all in for the biggest, just missed, and now they got the second biggest fish in the free agency market, and the Giants just got better. The Rockies haven't gotten that much better compared to those teams. Yeah, and I think you talked about the Rangers not being done. The Rangers, I mean, the reason they weren't willing to tear down in like right after they they should have they should have immediately started tanking right after Adrian Belcher retired. I think that was after the 2017 season. Maybe it was right after the 2018 season, but like that was the time. Like things weren't working out. It should have been the next era. Like Noah Mazzara should have been amazing. That was the time where it was supposed to be like him and, you know, Jerks and Profar being basically what Francisco Francisco Lindor is now and Joey Gallo being that guy and for the most part he was pretty much the only one that worked out. Uh, it hasn't worked out for the last season and a half, but he isn't that far removed from being an all-star. And he's a guy who I think both these teams could greatly benefit. The Rangers probably need to sign a left fielder. And I think the Rockies definitely have room in left field. And um, my own can he personal play center. He can, he can, he shouldn't He okay. played it in 2019. He played that in his breakout year. Um, this was my my one genius move of when, because when he came up, he was a third baseman. He was like the heir apparent to Adrian Beltre. And I was like, oh, that feels like a lot. I mean, the, when he got his major league debut is because Beltre was hurt for an extended portion of the season. He was fantastic there. Um, then they moved him to first base and they moved him to the outfield and he was fantastic. And like as a bit when he was still coming up, my buddy and I were like, Joey, Joey Gallo in center field. Let's put Joey Gallo in center field. This this big 6'5", 240-pound outfielder. Let's put him out there and see if he can do it. And then, like, two weeks later, they did it. And we're like, okay, like, are we crazy? Or is he, like, pretty decent out there? And, like, when he was having his breakout season, his first All-Star year in 2019, before he got hurt at the break and the Rangers weren't really the same since, he was a center fielder. And he was one of the top five players in the American League for that first half. And I think he could do it, but just the wear and tear on his body for a guy that is that big is is pretty intense. Now, if you look at his baseball savant page, it's it's always so insane. Like, I love these. Ins- it's like him and like O'Neill Cruz and just some of the other guys. Not the like, well, I like Jacob deGrom's in another way where it's just like all red, 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 red. <laughs> but it's just like bright red, bright blue, like one, he's at the first percentile of expected batting average, strikeout rate and whiff rate. But you look at the walk rate, he's in the top 5% of baseball, um, arm strength, top 10%, barrel rate, top 2% of baseball and hard hit rate, the top 6%. So like the guy is still making hard contact. And I think just the pressures of New York and to a lesser extent, LA, he wasn't getting consistent playing time, but I feel like on both of these teams, he would get a decent shot. Is that a guy who you would like? And I am emotionally prepared for this if he goes to the Rockies, because on my 2020 MLB, the show that I I have not (laughs) bought a new one since then, I have a creative player um, where Joey Gallo left. And I think right around this time to go to um, the Rockies and sign like a 10 year deal there. So I've already seen it and I'm prepared for it and I would be happy for you. Is that something that you would want or is there another like buy low free agent that you think the Rockies should be more all in on? You know, here's the thing. If, if, if it's a low, the Rockies can't offer Joey Gallo more than a year. That's I really think or well, I don't think anybody I don't think anybody will. I don't yeah. think he will take more than that. I don't think he but if it's a one year deal, the Rockies have someone that can play center field that enough. They're, they're really looking for a left handed center field, but a left handed outfield power bat is exactly what the Rockies are looking for. What does Joey Gallo fit those numbers? I mean, yes, the strikeouts there, but the Rockies strike out a ton. So a batter is coming up to strike out like me perfectly fine to take the take a flyer on Joey Gallo have him play right the Rockies have some interesting options where he can maybe play right field Chris Bryant plays left field I didn't think you're going to move him anytime soon maybe you flip them on the corners there and you have Bryant play right and I mean, Gallo Ga- plays left or Gallo's a multi-time goal glover in right field so yeah I mean I feel like that'll be perfect and, plus, and who are you replacing plus, by the way by the way Fun connection that I didn't make until just now. Actually, in that alternate universe, Chris Bryant, I think, also did sign with the Rockies. <laughs> there you go. Um, so maybe Bryce but both has those a, guys, they're both uh, they're both Vegas kids, and I think they both played on a couple of the same travel ball teams coming up with Bryce Harper. They were kind of the the tag team trio of of Las yeah. Vegas. So for me, left handed power bat. Absolutely. That sounds like a, a a for sure win for the Rockies. I mean, and, and Joey Gallo, I, I agree. Low pressure. 
so if you're bad on the Rockies, who cares? No one's going to be making memes on you all over the internet about you striking out because it's the Rockies. No one's going to like, and I mean that in genuinely though, because until the Rockies reinvent themselves and reestablish themselves as relevant in the national conversation, it's a place for people who want to go reinvent their careers can do so a little bit more under the radar. Nobody knows who are, I bet you, I bet you, Bryce, if you weren't such a baseball mind, if I was to go out and try to talk to people about the Rockies and especially where I am right now, I don't think anyone could name someone that's on the team currently right now. Maybe Charlie Blackman. I yeah. think that he might be the only Rockies play. Actually, Chris Bryant, of course. So well, people would say Chris outside of Chris Bryant. I don't know how many people can name be, Rockies players. So if be, you're looking to come in and, and reinvent and, and reestablish in a little bit more of a low key thing, and still be a star. I mean, that's a big signing. I mean, Joey Gallo's still a name. Joey Gallo's successful. He was an all star in 2021. In 2021. Like, it wasn't yeah. that long ago. People were like, oh, no, he's dead. He's washed. Like, no, he's still a good Players player. Players can bounce back all the time. It's the same thing with Bellinger. Yes, I will happily take a year of Cody Bellinger. Yes, I will happily take a year of Joey Gallo because the Rockies need one year of an out of a veteran outfielder to fill time for your next big prospect who's supposed to be the next big thing for your outfield. This is a fine, it would be a fine move and I would welcome this for sure because who am I supposed to be more excited for Joey Gallo in the lineup? Randall Gritchick? And like, I mean, that's really, when you look at the players that, that Joey Gallo would be competing with, Charlie Blackman is going to be the Rockies' primary DH. He's opted in, he's going to, but the Rockies, he knows he finally embraced being a DH. Charlie Blackman is not going to, finally. We love you, Chuck, but been terrible in right field for a long time. Randall Gritchick can play there. They have their prospects playing there. It's really – that's what it boils down to, Bryce, is are they actually going to go and sign this outfield bat that they've been talking about this offseason, or do they not do that and leave the floor open for plugging in as many of their prospects this year as they can and kind of sneakily doing the quote-unquote – rebuild season because it won't be this year but it'll be next year that these prospects that the Rockies believe in are going to have a little bit a good amount of MLB time and it's time to see if this is going to be the next generation of successful Rockies baseball if these prospects pan out well if if my favorite team can't sign my large adult son Joseph Nicholas Gow I would love for him to go to you have a fantastic year and then the Rangers do what they do and spend big money on bring him home. I my only concern would be for the Rockies fans in attendance because that Joey Gallo power in that Coors Air, he might cause some legit craters in the stadium. But it would be well, well worth it to see him go there and thrive in a beautiful stadium with a wonderful fan base who deserves someone fun and good like Joey Gallo. But Paul, thank you so much for joining me on today's show. I really do hope that the Rockies go the Rangers route and just spend a bunch of money, not just get one Chris Bryant, but just keep on going, go spend some money, turn some heads, make people confused, throw them off guard. Don't let them know your next move because <laughs> that would be a lot, lot of fun, but that's going to do it for this edition of locked on Rangers and locked on Rockies. Paul, where can the fine folks listening to locked on Rangers find you and all your work? You can find me at Paul Holden 33 and the show at L O Rockies on Twitter. That's uh, all the stuff's there. Uh, if you want to learn more about the Rocks, that's where you can find us. Absolutely. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining me. Rockies fans can find me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can find the show at Locked On Rangers and find us on YouTube, Locked On Rangers YouTube listeners. Go subscribe to Locked On Rockies. Help Paul Holden. He is trying to hit that thousand benchmark. He will get there once the range, once Joey Gallo signs there and the Rockies surprise everyone and win the NL West. I'm hoping you can get there as soon as possible. But thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, Paul, for joining me. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy baseball.